revolution starts, boosting Punjab's agriculture with technology and pesticides. By the 70s, it was clear these pesticides were ruining the soil and natural water system. Farmer suicide rates start to rise. So Punjab's majority political party, Dear Gali Dal, demands more autonomy from central government. My name is Gopal The government has now declared Punjab a dangerously disturbed area, but Hindus believe it will remain until the police arrest Bindrawale and his followers. Bindrawale's supporters were accused of terrorism, which he denied. I will never praise anyone for killing someone, but I do praise the killing of a cruel man. The protest will stop when the Sikhs are no longer enslaved. The Prime Minister's son, Rajiv Gandhi, wanted action. I think we are not being tough enough in Punjab. Bindra Ali was ordered to leave the Golden Temple. He refused until his demands were met. Steps have been taken by many negotiators, and it transpires from all the accounts that Mrs. Gandhi had made up her mind that she was going to use the military option to the Punjab problem. 1st of June 1984, Operation Blue Star begins. The army had taken up positions all the way around the temple, and it was quite clear that they were in a position to start the siege. 3rd of June. It's a significant day for Sikhs. The martyrdom of their fifth Guru, Guru Arjun Dev. So the Golden Temple is even busier with thousands of worshippers. The Indian Army enters the complex. Fighting has been continuing around the Golden Temple in Amritsar, occupied by Sikh extremists. On the night of the 5th of June... The assault began under cover of darkness. 50 soldiers died there. The Army commanders decided the casualties had become unacceptable and ordered in armoured personnel carriers. Eventually, Bindra Ali was killed on the 6th of June, 1984. But it wasn't just him and his men who died. The worshippers trapped in the temple in the storing summer heat were caught in the crossfire. There was a woman with a baby. While she was breastfeeding, a grenade blew up her face. He lost his mum, I lost my wife, this man lost his daughter. All four died instantly. The official figures say the death toll was about 1,000, probably about 300 army personnel and the rest civilians, but unofficially the figures were claimed to be much higher. Months later, on the 31st of October, Mrs. Gandhi is assassinated. Indira Gandhi, ruler of the world's largest democracy, died today, shot down by two of her own bodyguards. They were Sikhs taking revenge for the invasion of their...
zero, two, four, six, two, zero, three, one, seven, zero. Торкин, на Торкин. На Торкин, здесь вот. Я пытался другой. Один, два, три, четыре, пять, шесть, семь, восемь, девять, десять, одиннадцать, Because I tried several times, not what mm -hmm. it's, it's, No, uh, bottom point. Bottom point is off the tiller or no? No, uh, empty. It's empty now. Going back empty. So deliver and going empty? Yeah, it's I've done the delivery. Yeah. as imams to ensure that we are fully informed the couple that are being married and that we ourselves educate ourselves regarding the laws of marriage in our country and the place of nikah in our country which is not as i now correctly pointed out or recognized marriage within english law and it's important for imams to remind particularly the women that should they opt out of registering their marriage under civil law, then they run the risk of being financially at a huge loss and a disadvantage should the nikah end in a talaq, in a divorce. But the thing is, as imams, we don't have any any powers with which we can enforce this. We can only recommend, advise, and point out the potential uh, difficulty that might arise. There are cases where the women themselves may not want to register their marriage, especially uh, in our country as we see more and more women are independent financially. They may be more wealthy than the husband and may not wish to end up in a situation where they are having to give half of what they own. Because under the Nikah law, whatever is the woman's property remains hers alone husband has no right to it. Uh, Ella, in, in your experience, uh, and just picking up on, on what Ibrahim said there about some women uh, not wanting to register their, their marriages, is that something that you've seen happen? Oh yes, absolutely. I completely agree with Imam Mogra that uh, it's a money issue primarily. If the woman is wealthy or has properties, she doesn't want often to give rights to her husband. Now, the way to do that Islamically, I would argue, is to have a prenup which brings your you know, views and Islamic rights into line with English law. Why be vulnerable to a 50-50 split? Have a simple prenup, they don't cost much, they are enforceable in this country since 2012. So why not have that and have your husband have the dignity of a legal marriage? Anna, it's really important. Is this law going to change anytime soon, though? 
because at the moment it looks like it's up to the couple whether they want to register or not and then further on down the line they're, they're dealing with the consequences of, of not registering. I do challenge the government on this. We have lobbied them and they have said that the Brexit meant that legislative time is not available to reform this law. But I would challenge anybody listening that we are still going to come after the government to give accountability to the general population who needs to be protected. This affects the social welfare system, benefit system, schooling, social services. There's so much decay happens as a result of abandoned wives and children. I think it's um, public policy that has to change. Why are three faiths protected 70 years later and the others have to fend for themselves? It makes no sense. Yeah, I agree, but I just wanted to add one more dimension to this. Um, through the offices of the Muslim Council of Britain, we've been working with the Law Commission for England and Wales, looking at the reform in marriage law. And there's an exciting proposal on the table, which we have helped to, to formulate, is that there was a time when we were trying to promote mosques to register as places of marriage. Just as that was picking up, we had the same-sex marriage bill, and mosques became worried that if they were registered as places of marriage, then they would be obliged to carry out a same-sex marriage. So that saw a decline in people signing up. Moving on, we now have this idea of perhaps licensing the individual, for example, myself, who carried out the nikah, as uh, someone who has been trained uh, fully to understand English law regarding marriage, uh, safeguards, uh, checks and balances, and all that, everything, what a registrar would do, I would do, and I would conduct that nikah ceremony, which would then be recognized under English law. Uh, that is on the back burner. Uh, clearly for, for reasons that Ina suggested, perhaps Brexit and other things. But I think that is also another way forward where we can ensure that a number of benefits come out of this. Those who choose to be registered under English law are having to pay twice the cost, if you like, once for registry and then you've got the party and everything else to follow, whereas you can do it all in one place. I recently conducted a nikah where the registrar would have went first, they had a civil marriage, and after that I came in and I did the religious marriage. Mm. So there are different models, but we need to ensure, as Aina rightly pointed out, that the women are not disadvantaged and reassure them that if they are financially better off than their husband, then they can have a, a prenup, which is endorsed by the Islamic teachings and by Sharia, and they'll be within their right to stipulate certain conditions to the nikah. Sheikh Ibrahim Mogra and Enna Khan there. The Pope has apologised following reports that he used a homophobic slur during a private meeting about whether gay men should be admitted to seminaries. The Italian word, frocciagini, in English translates as an extremely derogatory word used against homosexual men. The church regards homosexuality as objectively disordered, but there are some who believe that large numbers of priests are gay. Earlier, I spoke to Father James Allison, who does use that translation of the derogatory term in this interview, which some listeners may find offensive. As a gay man, I should say that it's the sort of word that gay people use amongst ourselves, about ourselves, and about other people frequently. The English word would be faggotry. It could be a, a friendly thing amongst ourselves. It could be similarly a friendly but also self critical thing amongst ourselves. And it can be something absolutely venomous. It could be a venomous attack. From an outside. Now, I think that the great mistake in understanding what was going on is that the vast majority of the public are unaware that if the Pope is speaking off the record to a group of bishops, in this case the Italian bishops' conference, the Pope is addressing a group that is majoritatively gay. In other words, the room was full of gay men. Those gay men will have different degrees of self acceptance. Some of them will be very conservative and self hating quite poisonous dealing with this issue. Some of them would have been longing for uh, a quiet attack. And I suspect that when the Pope used the word, that it was actually quite a friendly and funny word. Well, you mentioned that, that an actual majority of priests and bishops in the Catholic Church are gay. With all due respect to you, how can we know whether that's true? Well, of course, statistically, we can't. But ask anybody in the country's concerned, and they will tell you roughly the same thing. And with the bishops' conference, typically, it's a higher proportion than gay priests in general. 
because when it comes to choosing bishops, they have to choose people who do not have publicly visible friendships with people of the opposite sex, who might then turn out to be girlfriends. So it's not surprising in the end that you have a large proportion of gay men in the Episcopal. Now, amongst the priests, it's certainly a majority. Well, whatever the I percentage may actually be, you say that the Pope had some justifications in, in using the language that he did. Why is that? Remember, this was within a discussion about allowing gay men into the sanctuary. Just try and imagine yourself within a film being directed by a mixture of Fellini and Buñuel. You have a, a group of largely gay men discussing whether or not gay men should be allowed into the seminary. Seminaries which all of them have been through, all of them know how gay they were when they were there. Apparently, a group has been working on a paper to try and deal with this for some time, which means amidst these people, all of whom are not able to speak very clearly and honestly about this issue with themselves, but have a certain fellow feeling about it, to come to what everybody knows is the rational end game. The rational end game is, of course, there should be uh, gay people and straight people in the seminary. Of course, what the Pope has said frequently before is, I just want normal young men. Here's the difficulty. Everybody knows that, but everybody knows that while the teaching stands as it is, even though everybody knows that the teaching is false, except for the one or two hard lines, the kind of kids who come into the seminary are likely going to be inducted into having to live a lie in order to survive. And that's the world that everybody wants to bring to an end. How can that be brought to an end? Well, that's off to a bad start if everybody's having to hide who they are. Father James Allison there. I'm joined now by Austin Ivory, who's the biographer of Pope Francis. Uh, Austin, is the Pope homophobic? Absolutely not. I don't think there's been a Pope who has been more welcoming and more inclusive of gay people. And in his apology, he made clear yeah, everybody is welcome in the church. And yeah, I really enjoyed what Father James just said, and I have enormous respect for, for, for his account of everything. But I think it's important to make clear that the discussion is not about whether or not to admit gay people to the, to the priesthood, because of course there are gay people in the priesthood, and that in and of itself is not a problem. The Pope's concern is with those who have not resolved their sexuality, who are in many ways acting out or seeking to resolve these issues. And there has been a problem in Italian seminaries in the last few years where there have some needed to be intervened because of cliques and a kind of a gay subculture and so on, which has appeared. Now that's a sign of people who are not yet ready to live out chastity and celibacy well. And that's his concern. That's what he was saying well, to the bishops. If there is a large number of, of gay priests, whatever the percentage, Austin, does that make the church's teaching on, on homosexuality hypocritical? Well, it's what's my church teaching. I mean, the whole um, disorder thing is a, is a kind of moral doctrinal point, but just generally I can sum up by saying that the, the church believes that sex is reserved to marriage and therefore all sex outside marriage of whatever sort it, it is considered to be not to the purpose of sex. God created sex, but specifically related to the priesthood, it's really important that we have a, a male priesthood which is not married, and it's important that the, their chastity, their sexuality, if you like, is lived out in a way which allows them to form healthy relationships with each other and with the wider world. And that's why it's so important nowadays to have an emphasis on human spiritual formation. And that happens, by the way, in the seminaries in the world that I'm familiar with. I think particularly the last 10 15 years, we're not getting those reports anymore because of the emphasis on, on, on human formation. Well, Austin, would you say the Pope is leading or resisting a liberalisation of the Church's attitude to homosexuality here? I think he's making clear that God's love is always inclusive of everybody, that uh, nobody is, should be excluded or condemned for who they are, how they are. Uh, and that's been, and he's, he's had a tremendous ministry to gay people as Pope, receiving them, welcoming them, <laughs> loving them, and not just in words, but also in actions, in things like, for example, making it clear that gay people can be blessed, even if they're in a a same-sex relationship. So I think he's acted in very concrete ways to manifest 
with that universality, if you like, of God's love. But just because, you know, we were talking here, as James made clear, about the Pope in a closed door meeting mm. with his fellow bishops discussing a very sensitive issue about which many people feel strongly. And just on the word, which of course is a deeply offensive Last word. Last point that, here, Austin. Okay, but it's a deeply offensive word, but what's become clear is that somebody else used it, he picked up on it. Italian isn't his first language. I doubt he knew how offensive it was, and he apologised if he didn't within 24 hours. Austin Ivory, thank you very much for being with us this morning. That's it for this week's Sunday. Next week in the chair, it's William Crawley. If you'd like to comment on today's programme, you can email us at sunday at bbc.co.uk. You can also listen again or download the programme as a podcast from the BBC Sounds app, and you can follow the programme on social media. Just search BBC R4 Sunday, or one word. Rima Ahmed. Sunday was produced by Alexa Good and Barahatu Ibrahim. The studio managers were Amy Brennan and Tom Parnell. And now the disability advocate Shani Danda makes the Radio 4 appeal on behalf of Ad International. As a disabled person, I know that community is everything. Connecting with others, sharing understanding and experiences, and being in solidarity helps us overcome challenges and know we're not alone. Communities for disabled people that Ad International is committed to supporting. In Kampong Cham, in Cambodia, 34-year-old Vanessa is welcoming her guests to her monthly meeting for disabled women. She's a well-regarded campaigner who represents the interests of these women. As well as hosting these meetings, she organises training for them and liaises with the local government to get the services these women need. Lynette has a disability after having an accident as a child. She finds it hard to walk and understands the stigma disabled people can face. The bullying got so bad, she had to drop out of school. But then, in 2009, she started this support group. And since then, disabled women in her area have been meeting to discuss issues that affect them and no subject is off the table. This is just the kind of on-the-ground group Ad International wants to help. It listens to grassroots advocates like Vanette and they can decide how and where money is used. She's keen to expand and wants to start helping her members set up small businesses of their own so they can live independently. Many find it hard to get work, so this, she thinks, is a solution and Ad agrees. By supporting Ad International today, you can help advocates like Vanette make positive changes in their communities. Anything you give today will help, and a group of generous individuals will match your donation to a combined total of £11,000. You can give now. Just search online for BBC Radio 4 Appeal or call 0800 404 8144. That's 0800 404 8144. Or you can write a check to Ad International and send it to Free Post BBC Radio 4 Appeal. That's the whole address Free Post BBC Radio 4 Appeal. Importantly, mark the back of your envelope Ad International. Thank you. Charlie Danda. Calls are free from landlines and mobiles, and you can find all the details for giving online if you search for BBC Radio 4 Appeal. If you're a UK taxpayer and you want Ad International to collect the gift aid on your donation, please include an email or postal address so they can send you a gift aid declaration. Now with a look at the weather, here's Simon King. Ron, thank you so much indeed. Good morning. We've got some patches of mist and fog out there at the moment, but uh, they're pretty isolated and they're clearing away pretty quickly through this morning. For many of us, it's going to be a very warm and sunny day. But we do have some cloud this morning across parts of the eastern and southeastern areas of England. That's going to thin and break up to bring some sunny spells. And crucially, there will be some lighter winds compared to the last couple of days. It's not going to feel quite as chilly as it has done with temperatures getting up to about 19 to 23 degrees. In southwest England, Wales and the Midlands, the mist of fog clearing away quite nicely. Lots of sunshine through this morning. But as we go through the day, we will see some 
higher cloud moving its way south, which is maybe turning the sunshine a bit more hazy into the afternoon. The temperature still getting up to about 19 to 22 Celsius and pretty warm in that sunshine. Across northern England, again, missed the fog clearing away. Pretty sunny this morning, but again, high cloud, making the sunshine a bit milky later on. Temperature 17 to 20 Celsius. And for Scotland and North Ireland today, this is where we're going to see some changes in the weather. We've got some sunshine this morning around eastern and southern Scotland, but the cloud is thickening towards northern and western areas. So that cloud moving its way south and eastward by the end of the day. Some patch of rain in northern and western Scotland as well. Temperatures generally get into about 14 to 17 degrees, although we might just squeeze out a, a 20 Celsius in eastern Scotland during the afternoon. As we go through tonight, there will be more cloud generally across the UK, so it's not going to be quite as chilly as it was last month. 11 or 12 degrees, and we'll also see some very light and patchy rain moving its way south and across Scotland. So into Monday, from Scotland and Northern Ireland, eventually to bring some sunshine into the afternoon. England and Wales, however, while it'll be fairly cloudy, there'll be a few bright or sunny spells and just some very light and patchy rain, perhaps for some northern areas through the morning. Simon King, bye bye. Weather, no, we're ready for weather. Sorry. Thank you, Simon. This is BBC Radio 4. Now, for a look ahead to Broadcasting House at 9 o'clock, we say good morning to Paddy O'Connell. There's nothing wrong with the five now. There's nothing wrong with an excellent snowship. Um, good morning, Ron, and hello, good morning to you. Future Prime Ministers should swear an oath of office. So says the constitutional historian Peter Hennessy, he's talking to us. From the news, hopes are fading for the White House peace deal for Gaza. We'll get a briefing. At home, we seek the standout moments of the election. And as Radio 4 prepares to celebrate the work of George Orwell in a new season, we go back on the road to Wigan Pier to ask what our towns still tell us about ourselves. BBC News at 8 o'clock on Sunday the 2nd of June. Good morning, this is Charles Carroll. Sir Keir Starmer has promised Labour will cut <laughs> the election without saying by how much or when. Two right-wing ministers in Israel have threatened to bring down Benjamin Netanyahu's government if he accepts the latest ceasefire plan. And a Chinese spacecraft has successfully landed on the far side of the Sir Keir Starmer has pledged to cut what he called the sky-high levels of legal migration to the UK if Labour wins the election. In an interview with The Sun on Sunday newspaper, he sets out plans to prioritise British workers and crack down on businesses that break employment laws. Sir Keir said the Conservatives had completely failed to reduce net migration and insisted he would not duck the challenge. Our political correspondent Alex Forsyth reports. Net migration, the difference between the number of people arriving in the UK and leaving, reached 685,000 last year. Sir Keir Starmer has previously said that is too high. Now he's promised he would bring that number down, though he hasn't said by how much or by when. Labour would introduce a new law to ensure government departments, skills agencies and employers came up with plans to train British workers in sectors that rely heavily on immigration to plug skills gaps and strengthen laws to ban businesses that exploit workers from hiring staff from abroad. This year, the government introduced measures designed to cut legal immigration, including increasing the minimum salary needed for skilled workers. Conservatives said no one believed the Labour leader was serious about tackling immigration. The SNP said Labour and the Tories had cruel immigration policies that harmed Scotland's economy, while the Lib Dem said they would raise wages for carers because the sector was too reliant on workers from overseas. The Conservatives and the Liberal Democrats will both set out election pledges on health in England today. The Tories say they would build more GP surgeries and expand the number of treatments offered by pharmacies. The Condemns are promising to reverse cuts to public health grants for local councils. Here's our health editor, Hugh Lee. Yeah, the government launched a new service at pharmacies in England, offering patients consultations for some conditions, including shingles, urinary tract infections and sore throats. Pharmacists can issue antibiotics where appropriate. The aim is to take the pressure off GPs. Similar services have already been set up in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. The Conservatives say they want to expand the scheme in England to cover more conditions such as acne and chest infections. The party also wants to get 250 more GP surgeries built or modernised 
and more diagnostic centres in local communities. But Labour said the numbers of qualified GPs and practice surgeries had fallen under the Tories. The Lib Dems, meanwhile, say they want to reverse cuts in budgets for public health services provided by local authorities, with more health checks and blood pressure tests. The SNP leader, John Swinney, will formally launch the party's general election campaign today. At a rally in Glasgow, he'll urge people to vote SNP to put Scotland's interests first and will say independence offers the country a better future. Mr Swinney will say that it's crystal clear that as First Minister, he has been focusing on people's top concerns. Police in the Israeli city of Tel Aviv have dispersed thousands of protesters who are calling for the country's government to accept a deal to end the war in Gaza. The proposal was put forward by President Biden and begins with a six-week ceasefire in the withdrawal of Israeli troops. Hamas says that it will accept it if Israel does. But two far-right Israeli ministers have warned that if that happens, they'll quit. From Jerusalem is our Middle East correspondent, Hugo Bashega. Calling the proposal reckless, the National Security Minister, Itamar ben Gavir, said it would be a victory for terrorism. Bezalel Smotrich, the finance minister, said he was against any deal unless Hamas was wiped out and that the war must continue. If they do quit the coalition, it could lead to the end of the Netanyahu government. In a statement in which he did not reject or accept the plan, the Prime Minister insisted that there would be no permanent ceasefire in Gaza until the destruction of Hamas's military and governing capabilities. This appeared to put in doubt a key element of the deal. Last night in Tel Aviv, tens of thousands of people gathered to urge the Prime Minister to accept the plan. Groups of protesters were dispersed by mounted police and water cannon. Some said they fear the Prime Minister may sabotage the proposal. Officials in the Indian state of Uttar Pradesh say that at least 33 polling station staff died of heat stroke yesterday, the final day of voting in the country's election. At one point, a temperature of just under 47 Celsius was recorded. A Chinese spacecraft has successfully landed on the unexplored far side of the moon, which is never visible from Earth. It touched down in a huge crater known as the South Pole Alien Basin, and will now aim to bring back rock and soil samples. Our Beijing correspondent, Laura Bicker, reports. The Chang'e 6 spacecraft has been orbiting the moon, waiting to land since it was launched from China's Wenchang Space Center in early May. The landing is fraught with risks, as it's very difficult to communicate with the spacecraft on the far side of the moon, which faces permanently away from Earth. The plan now is for the probe to spend the next three days using a drill and a mechanical arm to extract some of the moon's oldest rocks from a huge crater on its south pole. Scientists are keen to find out if this region of the moon has ice and therefore access to water. Tennis and the defending men's champion Novak Djokovic is through to the last 16 of the French Open after a five-set match which didn't finish until gone at two o'clock in the morning. His victory over the Italian Lorenzo Mazzetti means that he has equaled Roger Federer's record of 369 wins in Grand Slam matches. Djokovic said the spectators helped him fight back.